Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, uh, so much for um, uh, the Trials Hub for the invitation. Uh, and as Declan said, um, I define myself as an implementation researcher. That's the work that I've been uh, engaged with for the last 30 years. And I want to really talk about um, how we're starting to think about needing to do trials in a different way with implementation science uh, um, to more efficiently advance knowledge, addressing some of the kind of issues that uh, uh, Matthias was talking about earlier. Um, I thought I'd start off with uh, uh, some uh, greetings from Ottawa. It's not quite as bad as this yet. Uh, in February, um, um, uh, typically this is what happens. We have a, a canal that goes through the, uh, the city centre. We drop the level and people can skate on it. It is the largest area of ice rink around the world, and it's about 8.4 kilometers from end to end. Um, and you see people, and it's minus five, 35 at night, so midnight, skating down the canal in the dark. It's, uh, it's quite, quite something. Um, OK, so, so to start off, uh, or talk a little about, bit about implementation science, this is what gets me out of bed every morning. Um, so I've been working in the field for about, well, for 30 years. Uh, and what motivates me is that um, probably the most consistent health services research finding is there's a gap between what the evidence says healthcare systems and healthcare professionals should be providing and what patients actually receive. So between 30 to 40 percent of patients don't get care uh, that is of proven effectiveness and around 20 to 25 percent of patients get care that is either not needed or is potentially harmful. And there is no healthcare system in the world that has got this right. Even those that we would think of high functioning, like maybe Kaiser Permanente or uh, the Veterans Affairs in the, in the US, they are struggling with this. And the fact that no one has got it right says it's a difficult problem. But it's probably one of the most fundamental challenges, I think, if we're thinking about ensuring you get maximum benefits from, uh, uh, from research for, for patients. My first boss said, if we just stopped doing any new research now and implemented what we know, we'll actually get more health gains than whatever will be discovered in the next 30 years. And these gaps are not just about new emerging findings. I left medical school in 1984. We knew that diabetics should get their eyes screened regularly. And yet, in my country, about 40% of patients do not get their eyes screened regularly. And there's work going on in Cork, which is probably a similar, similar figure uh, in Ireland as well. So these are really difficult, challenging issues. And this is kind of what implementation science is trying to address. You know, how do we actually sort of uh, basically close that gap between what the evidence says we should do and what we can actually achieve? There's a whole range of stuff in implementation science, which I'm not going to go through, um, but I put it up to, to, to say, although I'm going to focus on trials today, there's, there's, it's a very broad area of research that needs lots of different sort of approaches to address it. So I'm going to focus particularly on evaluations of different implementation interventions. And um, fundamentally, one of the challenges is that, uh, 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 well, it's not one of the challenges, uh, but something I'd argue very strongly is we need to do rigorous evaluations mainly pragmatic cluster randomized trials of implementation interventions because the effects are modest. We've not found a penicillin in implementation. What we're seeing are benefits which are of the order of probably 5 to 10 percent and it would be very easy for us either to interpret or to have a false positive false negative study when we're talking about relatively marginal effects. We have a limited understanding of the likely confounders and effect modifiers. So if we were doing an observational clinical study, we'd have basic science, we'd have uh, epidemiological data that might allow us to start to think about what might even be confounders. If someone said, we've done this quality of care across all the hospitals in Ireland, and we, what we want to do is kind of basically correct for known confounders about, yeah, so we can look at the kind of quality across those hospitals, I wouldn't even know what to start with. I had no idea about what I would actually try and correct for. So trials are the only way of actually trying to give us a defense of that. And there are significant opportunity costs if ineffective or inefficient interventions are recommended by or to healthcare systems. Healthcare systems don't have a lot of money for implementation activities. So if they choose to take on things which are ineffective or inefficient, uh, um, then they're basically wasting those resources. So fundamentally, we need um, trials and well-designed quality experiments to basically develop the evidence base about how we can improve the quality of care. 
Uh, and there's a lot of trials out there. So um, for a long time, I was involved in the Cochrane Effective Practice and Organisational Care Group, and we we eventually gave up trying to develop a register. We probably had about 10,000 studies, predominantly trials in our register, by the time we gave up trying to keep it up to date, because they're just too hard to find. But one of the consistent things, particularly if you do systematic reviews in the area, you come away incredibly depressed. Because all of these studies, or a lot of these studies, have pretty fundamental problems with them. Often technical issues are, 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 are uh, 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 problematic, so people ignore the fact there's clustering across the randomized trials, or people, a typical thing is that well, people randomize a small number of units. We can identify 12 family practices we can work with, therefore our sample size is 12, and that's kind of it. Um, the, then you end up with unrealistic effect sizes. We're going to detect a 25% absolute improvement in care. Um, there are very few trials that get anywhere close to that. And uh, well, I've said unit analysis remain common. The designs, the majority of the two arm trials, intervention versus control. And I think in this sort of setting where uh, we'll talk about, I'll talk about this more as we go forward, but we can probably do better with designs, have different trial designs, which are going to be more informative for various reasons. The interventions are poorly designed, uh, they're very fair, rarely um, theory based, and there's very often insufficient feasibility testing. Uh, and people don't try and look at the causal mechanisms alongside the trials. Economic evaluation is rare, um, and reporting is terrible. So that's really good. So I spent 30 years often doing systematic reviews of these trials, and you come away thinking, oh my god, I want to do something. Um, but so, so there's a failure to build an informative science because we don't conduct the trials well. But there's also a failure to build a cumulative science. So I want to give the example of ordering feedback. So this is a common method that is used to try and improve performance by measuring people's performance and say how does it compare against the standard. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, we, um, a colleague of mine, Noah Ivers, updated the Cochrane Systematic Review in 2012, and by 2012 there are 140 trials of ordering feedback versus control. They showed that in general it works. The median effect across all those trials was a 4% absolute improvement with an interquartile range of 1 to 16%. One of the things we did was actually start, we, we did a cumulative analysis. So it's not a meta-analysis, this is a, a kind of a, a description of the, of the median and the, uh, 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 the interquartile range uh, 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 from the 25th to the uh, uh, 75th centile. Uh, and um, was this the... Yeah, so, so, so basically what you've got is sort of ba every, every kind of uh, few years when new trials were added, we basically recalculated the sort of median effect size. And you can see that even from very early on, you know, basically the effect sizes didn't change a huge amount, but you could certainly say by the early 2000s, pretty static. Um, but there were another, depending on where you put the cutoff, another 60 trials completed. So I would argue that you know, basically a two-arm trial of ordinary feedback versus control, when you're looking at body of evidence, is saying, in general, does ordinary feedback work? And we knew by 2000 it did. And we really did 60 trials where we added very little to the evidence base. We also did cumulative meta-regressions. And as you might expect, um, um, as you get more studies, your estimates get slightly more precise. But the underlying messages didn't change. Okay. So we have a problem because basically people are doing trials of questions we know actually works, uh, or, or we know the answer to, um, which is um, fundamentally problematic and unethical. So we did some, we had a, an international sort of workshop uh, a number of years ago, uh, and basically um, Noah Ivers comes up with great titles, so no more business as usual. Two arm trials of ordinary feedback versus control is not what we need to advance the knowledge base. We actually want to have head to head trials which might evaluate different ways of delivering ordinary feedback, ordinary feedback A versus ordinary feedback B, or ordinary feedback versus ordinary feedback with co intervention, or ordinary feedback versus alternative intervention. So we move, need to move much more into a kind of a comparative effectiveness framework. The challenge for us as implementation researchers when we do that is our sample size goes through the roof. Uh, and we're already normally scrabbling about to try and get these 12 family practices to work with us. And if you suddenly say, well, you need 150 to be able to detect a yeah, much smaller effect size, then most people would walk away. So one of the things that we've been trying to think about is how do we actually do this? How can we start to do large-scale 
implementation studies that we think are actually needed at this point in time. And we, we came up with this idea of what we're calling implementation laboratories. But one of the issues is healthcare systems are increasingly providing audience feedback at scale to hospitals, to family practices. Uh, and they can have access to all the hospitals in the UK, all the dental practices in Scotland. Um, and we kind of basically going to have conversations with them. And we sort of say, are you sure that your audience feedback, it's great using audience feedback, there's a cock and view that says it, should, it works. You know, um, are you absolutely sure that your audience feedback is perfect? And every time we've done that, people have said, no. Yeah, we recognise we made a number of arbitrary decisions that made sense to us. The feedback from the hospitals is kind of pretty good, but you know, there's actually yeah, you know, we realise that there may be other ways of designing feedback which would be more effective. Sometimes they say we'd really like to know what would happen if we ch if we did feedback this way rather than this way, and so we say, well, why don't you start to embed randomised controlled trials in what you're doing? Okay. So the idea is if your healthcare organization has, or is providing standard audit feedback A, uh, sorry, standard audit feedback, that becomes audit feedback A, and we test it against audit feedback B. Audit feedback B is better, more effective, so audit feedback B becomes a standard for that organization. Then you test B versus C. C is no, uh, is no more effective, it's less acceptable, it's more expensive, we get rid of C. Then we can test B and D. So the idea of embedding sequential trials in terms of how we actually just do business in a healthcare setting. Um, as a sidebar, one of the things also, one of the things about this is it actually allows you to build a team, but you can also start to think in a more standard way about how do we actually get the most out of these, pro these studies, these individual trials, what else might we want to do? So randomized controlled trials are great for uh, allowing us to make strong causal inferences about the effects of a program. Audit feedback B was better than audit feedback A, so that's a causal description. It tells us relatively little about how, why, under what circumstances A or B was better than A. So it doesn't tell us much about the causal explanation. And one of the problems with complex interventions is we need to know much more about kind of, okay, well, how did the intervention work under what settings? How was it modified by the context to actually allow us to think about generalizability? So we need, we can, if you've got a kind of standing group working with a healthcare system partner, um, start to sort of just embed a range of ways to try and improve the informativeness of, of implementation trials. So we can basically use in, interesting innovative designs. Imagine you've got you're doing a cluster trial and all of a sudden you have access to 800 clusters. Yeah, you can do so much with that and it's such an unusual occurrence. Design philosophy, pragmatic trials where you're actually testing interventions across a range of settings with some modifications allowed within the intervention also allow you to potentially explore whether these minor variations in how the intervention was designed or delivered or the context were likely effect modifiers. We can build in process evaluations that may, might focus on our intervention fidelity. There might be more traditional qualitative experiential process evaluations. Increasingly, we, we're trying to do theory-based process evaluations where if we've identified what we think the mechanism of action is, we actually go out and measure the pathways we think the intervention is working with and see if, that, if the pathway is activated and that leads to the behavior change you want. Uh, and we can do more with, um, um, with, with analytical approaches. So there's kind of quite a lot of additional things we can do about trials. And I think one of the things about a lot of implementation laboratories is you start to bring a kind of standing team together who, you know, over time can actually work out, we'd like you need study to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, and there should have been a, um, an economic evaluation there. There should always be an economic evaluation there, so I apologize to, um, uh, uh, to, to, to Dominic. Um, but if you go back to just the trials, the, you know, one of the things it does is it clarifies the responsibility of the healthcare system and the researchers. If I get funding for a trial and that funding pays for the intervention and we do the trial, uh, it could be positive. But once the research funding's gone away, basically the intervention normally just stops. It doesn't go anywhere. In this setting, particularly for audience feedback, um, basically, the healthcare system is already delivering audience feedback at scale. 
So there's very marginal cost for them to actually do this uh, uh, um, further, uh, and it means that the delivery of the intervention is not dependent on the research and the research costs. So in general, the healthcare system will be partner will be responsible for developing the priorities, what they want to, to be tested, uh, working with researchers to develop the prototype audit feedback. They, the healthcare system partner will deliver the feedback. In ordering feedback, they capture the data anyway because they're using this for the ordering feedback. Um, and with the researchers, help with the interpretation. And the job of the researcher is to help develop the prototype ordering feedback, the analysis, and the interpretation. Okay. So this means when our intervention work, uh, when when sort of basically the trial is over, it's very easy for the healthcare organisation to say, hey, B was better. So instead of giving 50% A and 50% B, we'll just turn everyone on to B. Or we'll then get ready for our next trial of B versus C. The other issue um, is that it also makes research relatively cheap. So if you are doing these implementation studies, the costs of the trials tend to be the cost of delivering the intervention and the data collection. And that's already being captured in the routine healthcare setting. Okay, so it's relatively cheap. I'm going to show you an example of a trial and then I'll tell you how much it cost. There are a whole range of benefits for both the researchers and the healthcare system partners. Uh, for the healthcare system partners, um, it's, a, it's a manifestation of being a learning healthcare system. So when they have to go back and get refunding from their government, often they can say, look, we're committed to trying to improve what we're doing, and we've demonstrated we've improved our audit feedback for, you know, by 3% over the last five years. Um, it also gives them access to academic experts. So our experience of healthcare organizations is they have fabulous people who are really thoughtful, have a lot of tacit and experiential knowledge, but they're not keeping up to date with what's happening in organizational psychology. They're not keeping up to date with what's happening in uh, um, 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 health psychology. And so by giving them access to research experts, they get a real benefit. They get kind of almost a, a booster of, of a lot of the basic science coming in. For the implantation scientists, we benefit from the tacit knowledge of these people. They have just amazing expertise and are really thoughtful and wise, and we learn everything you know, as much as we can from them. But it also allows us to actually test head to head what happens if you change the way you display the, the visual display of the audience feedback, which might lead to a 1% improvement in performance. We can probably test that. So here's the example I want to give. It's um, done by colleagues in Scotland from uh, the Health Services Research Unit, um, uh, Craig Ramsey and Jan Clarkson. And um, Jan runs a, a national program for guideline development for community dentists in Scotland. And then Jan and Craig got money alongside the guideline development to say, well, when we're developing the guidelines, let's also do the background work that allows us to develop an, an implementation intervention. And then sometimes that just gets rolled out by NHS Education Scotland. Sometimes it actually gets tested within a trial. They did a, a trial, or they did a guideline on, on prescribing by community dentists. And in Scotland at the time, something like 8% of primary care prescribing, antibiotic prescribing, was done by community dentists. And they decided they wanted to test an audit feedback intervention. This was the design they came up with. So the first thing to note is that there were, they randomized every general dental practice in Scotland. 795. They randomized them in a four to one ratio to either have a control group or to receive audit and feedback. Now, normally I'd say we don't need any two arm trials of audit and feedback versus control, but there are no studies of audit and feedback for dentists. And I think it's at least reasonable to think that maybe the, you know, the professional model of dentistry might be an effect modifier. So they had a four to one randomization of intervention versus control. But then, they did a two by two by two um, factorial design in the 80% that got the intervention. Okay, so the 80% got some form of feedback, but they also got randomized to whether they got uh, basically a sort of a, 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 an interpretive message with the feedback. If they were given a comparator to their local health board, and if they gave the, uh, the feedback uh, three times rather than twice over a 12 month period. And there's actually a good theoretical rationale behind all of those things that they were testing. And this is what they found. So the first of all, um, basically, people, the uh, dentists getting the audit feedback reduced their prescribing by about 6%, which tells us that dentists are like physicians and nurses who are like human beings. 
Okay, so it kind of, wow, that's great. Um, uh, um, but then if you actually looked at the kind of the, uh, the additional items, you got a larger effect or a greater reduction in antibiotics if you had the behavior change message, if you were given a health board comparator. But the frequency of, ordering feed, of giving ordering feedback didn't matter. Twice versus three times over 12 months didn't make a difference. So that what they did in effect is sort of say, if that, that, that's their kind of, well, it's A versus nothing to start off with, but they tested different ways of doing it. So their standard now of wanting to deliver ordering feedback is they're going to provide the, uh, the behavior change message, they're going to have a comparator, and they're going to do it twice a year. So in one trial, they have been able to answer sort of three important sort of uh, implementation science questions, but in very practical terms, helped to define what the standard for ordering feedback should be in dentists in Scotland. And they're now wanting to move on to the next sequential trial of it's probably going to be a variant of ordering feedback versus ordering feedback versus uh, uh, and some form of co-intervention, I think. Um, but just, I'm, I'm, I'm breath, my breath, I lose my breath when I kind of look at the ambition of this trial. But this is kind of what we should be trying to do. Okay? This is achievable and feasible. Um, it just requires us to basically build relationships, build partners. It's really hard work. Um, be in it for the long haul with, with the groups that you're working with. So Jan Clarkson have been working with NHS Education Scotland for 20 odd years and they've got to this level of trust where this is, this is possible. Uh, another, a few other examples. Um, so in the UK, uh, uh, the NHS Blood and Transplant Special Authority does routine blood utilisation audits. Uh, and so we worked with them to, uh, with the UK NHR um, programme grant, and we designed two uh, or two replicated two by two factorial designs where one factor was changing how the audit and feedback was designed and delivered, and the other was how it was received in the hospitals. Because we were working with the NHS Blood and Transplant Authority, and they routinely went out and got the majority of hospitals to work with them, um, we had between 140 and 150 hospitals, basically all the hospitals in, in probably England and Wales, um, agreed to participate in these trials. If I, as a researcher, had gone out and said, I'm now going to spend yeah, my life trying to recruit all the hospitals in the UK or in England and Wales, it would have probably taken me 10 years and I'd have died of exhaustion or something. But because we were working with the NHS Blood and Transplant Authority um, and had the relationship, we were able to randomize basically the whole, uh, uh, the whole um, uh, of, of England and Wales. So we have now about half a dozen of these implementation laboratories. There are two in the UK, two in Canada, one in the Netherlands, one in the US, and we've got an, about another two or three groups. So one of the issues about, as an implementation scientist, go to where you can do the research, because you're trying to test some of these fundamental mechanisms. So, you know, I don't care if, uh, if one of the ways we can go and test stuff is by working with people in Australia. That's great. Or wherever there. But as we start to develop this expertise in these different laboratories around the world, wouldn't it be great if we actually started to work together? So we actually got together on a regular basis to share ideas about where we are in the field and what we need to do to further advance the field. So we've come up with the idea of a meta-laboratory. So um, uh, the Order and Feedback Meta Lab is a, a global community of science and practice. Um, there's about 50 scientists who are spending the majority of their time thinking about order and feedback. So they really like getting in the room together because they can nerd out about order and feedback. You know, normally, if you go to a general audience, you have to spend 10 minutes saying this is what order and feedback is, and eventually you might say something interesting there. They just dive in and it's, it's lovely. Um, but it can allow shared learning across studies and laboratories. It can allow shared expertise. In Ottawa, I'm really fortunate to work with a wonderful biostatistician called Monica Talliard, who is developing uh, uh, basically the methods of using repeated measures in cluster trials to improve sample size uh, or improve power. And people around the world are benefiting from Marion through the, through, through, uh, sorry, not Marion, uh, Monica. Uh, um, we can also think about opportunities for potential plan replication. Okay, we've got two or three studies that are all looking at what happens if you do a different comparator. And we might get to the stage of, sort of saying, well, actually, we don't think we need to test that anymore. Or, well, it worked over here, but not over here. So why don't we test it elsewhere to see whether that will work? Um, and it also is building an international community of the, of the healthcare system partners. So we meet every year for a day. 
uh, on science and we have an engagement day where we go out and say, okay, in this jurisdiction, who are the people providing audit and feedback? Let's invite as many of those as we can in the room so we can learn from them, but also we can tell them this is kind of how audit and feedback um, uh, or, 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 or what the science of audit and feedback is about. We had one example with the uh, National Prescribing Service in Australia where we did a workshop, um, I didn't do it, it was uh, Sylvia Heizong who's an organisational psychologist and Justin Presso, where they basically sort of took uh, psychological ideas about how you optimise feedback and they ha um, had a workshop where they showed people examples of audience feedback and basically people just poked their, their fingers into it and said that's awful or we'd do it very differently. Um, Jane London, who runs the audience feedback approach for or, or group for uh, National Prescribing Service, went back to uh, um, Australia and did the same exercise with her team. And the, for, in the morning, they basically poked holes in everybody else's audience feedback. And then in the afternoon, she said, let's look at ours now. And they basically um, <laughs> found out that it wasn't as good as they thought it was. And they came up with 10 principles which are much more theory-based uh, and empirically-based about how to optimize their feedback. So we're committed to trying to work with healthcare partners to ensure that the benefits, not just in these laboratories, but elsewhere, are picked up. So, so far, I've given you an example where we've, we're basically sort of trying to optimize a solution that has been commonly used in, in healthcare uh, systems. What I want to do now is sort of say, uh, is give another example, which is where um, the, a jurisdiction has taken this on as a way of designing programs and problem solving. So this is a Hunter New Valley um, Population Health Program in Australia. Uh, and um, um, in particular, sort of John Vigas and Luke Wolferden are um, the leads there. But this is, um, this is a, a service organization that's delivering prevention and population health programs. Um, but they've managed over time to basically develop an incredibly strong research base. So about half their staff are externally funded from research. Um, but the researchers get involved in service delivery and the service delivery people get involved in research. And what they have done is they've developed a standard way of thinking their way into a problem for service delivery. So this is a, 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 a sort of a simplified model that was developed by another colleague, but basically using a, the same process as they go address any problem, which allows them to then learn as they go forward because they're using shared approaches and shared methods. So it's largely identify what changes need to happen, understand what the barriers are, design your intervention to address those barriers, then uh, uh, evaluate them. And so I've got an example, uh, and um, this was led by um, uh, Nicole Nathan um, um, uh, with Luke, but one of the issues they're interested in was trying to improve the availability of um, fresh or of healthy food in school canteens. So in Australia, the choice of what happened, what food is provided in the can in school canteens is largely a function of the cook and the principal. Okay, those are the two decision makers. Um, um, but what was apparent was in many schools there were not you know, an adequate representation of healthy uh, options for, for, for the kids to eat. So Nicole and uh, uh, Luke, they, did a, uh, they basically went out, did a bio assessment, they interviewed the, the, the cooks, they interviewed the principals about what were the factors that were driving their decision making, what would make it easier to provide healthier food, etc. Um, and they came up with, they did a series of trials. So again, one of the ideas here is about a sequential series of trials that allows you to learn as you move forward. So the first trial was called the picnic trial and that, were, that was designed as a Rolls Royce intervention. So normally, I kind of, when I'm thinking about my trials, I try and design things which I think could be, could be operationalized in the real world. Here they said, we're just gonna try and throw everything at the problem because no one thinks this is a problem that can be solved. And if we do a trial which starts off you know, very sort of gently with an intervention that's very you know, relatively, uh, relatively modest and there's no effect, everyone will say, see, we told you it wasn't gonna work, we're not gonna, yeah, we'll just move on. So they did the Rolls-Royce intervention and that had a lot of you know, engagement of people going out into schools and sort of ongoing support as you went through. And they found something like a 40% improvement. So they ran, it's cluster trials, they ran in my schools, 40% improvement in the number of schools that were providing healthy food. So that was great. But they never thought that that intervention could be rolled out, could be scaled up and rolled out within uh, Hunter Valley because it's just too damn expensive. So the next time they did so it's very effective and very expensive. Next time they designed a smart car uh, example where they basically um, 
you know, took out lots of the kind of the expensive stuff and thought, could we actually do something much more cheaply? Cheaply. Um, so it's cheap, but and it was it, it did show about a ten percent absolute improvement, but it wasn't statistically significant for for the power. But they also didn't think ten percent was sufficient from a policy perspective. So they then went for a Toyota Corolla. Okay, so somewhere in the middle. So we kind of cut all this stuff out when we went to the smart car. Actually, let's put these things back in and see if we're going to get the benefit. And they, they, they found it, it's a kind of a Goldilocks thought. They got about a, I think it's about a 15 to 20% improvement. This was scalable within resources in the Hunter Valley. And this was basically what was rolled out across, um, uh, 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 across the, um, um, the, the rest of the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, the um, sorry, my brain stopped, uh, 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 across the rest of the, of the area. So you know, one of the things about this is they've used this a pro common approach to uh, problem solving repeatedly. And they've developed an incredibly strong methodological and theoretical critical mass. And they're working with, they're actually working with these service where this is now seen as how we do stuff. It's not, it's not kind of crazy research stuff. This is just what it is about providing high quality services in a developmental way. And so that's an example of an implementation laboratory where people are not necessarily trying to optimize one intervention, but address, uh, if you like, a, an area such as population health uh, uh, um, to, uh, uh, and use the same way to, to, or same methods so they're learning as they go forward. And in fact, the example we had from Scotland, again, that's another example where you know, there's been repeated studies that have been done over now a 10-year period um, using the same approaches with the same sort of healthcare system partners that have allowed them to learn hugely. So that was kind of what I wanted to say. I mean, so implementation laboratories, I think, are a special case of the learning healthcare systems, if you like that jargon. Um, and it aimed, they aim to undertake implementation research that is directly relevant to the needs of the healthcare system, whilst at the same time contributing to global science. And it's finding that sweet spot, okay? And it's trying to make sure that what we do has value to the healthcare system partners. There are increasing examples of, of implementation laboratories. Some focus on specific interventions like audit and feedback. Others focus on, you know, basically improving dental care in the community in Scotland, so jurisdictionals. And I think there's lots of opportunities for cross-laboratory collaboration and learning, um, both at the level of, you know, the audit and feedback labs getting together. But there's also kind of a set of structural issues that I think as more of these labs come, uh, uh, come across different settings or, uh, or different, uh, from different settings, we'll be also able to learn from each other and actually share sort of ideas about how we rapidly address this area. So implantation laboratories are uh, basically an attempt to address what I see as being one of the fundamental um, problems in implementation science, which is often we do unambitious, not particularly well designed or conducted uh, um, um, uh, 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 trials, and then they sit on the shelf because basically they never get they never get implemented. This actually will generate robust science that's relevant to healthcare systems, with a higher likelihood of being uh, then implemented as we move forward. So, so thank you very much.